Welcome to Wealth Champs Podcast. This is, I'm your host, Julius Hammond. I have a very special guest in the building, but before I reveal who it is, um, I want to I wanna give a few thanks, give a few shout outs. Shout out to my wife. She's out here in the waiting room uh, taking pictures because <laughs> of the guests we have in here. Um, I want to give shout out to my team, um, my editors and people who are here who make all these things happen behind the scenes. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and follow us on YouTube, Instagram, um, Rumble, uh, make sure you uh, hit that notification bell because we got some fire content coming in the future with some fire guests and just it's just going to be all around a great, great, great episode and great interviews coming up in the near future. Um, also, we have some merch that's going to be coming in within the next month or two. I'm working on some stuff right now, some T-shirts, some shorts, um, some uh, other apparel. So make sure you guys donate and uh, support the content. Now, for my guest, I have a very, very special guest in the building. He is a Pan-Africanist. He's uh, also a, 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 a clinical uh, doctor, a psychologist. He has his own school called the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I believe it's in Philadelphia, but it's almost, it will be open next year. I will let him talk about it. I want you guys to give a very, very Wealth Champs podcast warm welcome to Dr. Umar Johnson. <laughs> Glad How you doing, Dr. Here. Johnson? Thanks for having me, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, brother. Hey, man, uh, Dr. Johnson, I've been following you for years now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like I told you before we started recording here, um, I, I, we go back to um, freaking uh, Roland Martin, um, all the breakfast clubs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are a wealth of knowledge, man. I don't even understand some of the venture on the hate that comes mm -hmm. your way because we, we uh, our pigmentation, I should say, black, black folks, Africans, there's not a lot of us, <laughs> bless you, there's not a lot of us that are helping each other. Correct. You know what I mean? We Correct. always have to go to the the, the powers that be or the white uh, pro, you know, power structure to try to get some help, some mm -hmm. handouts. Mm -hmm. And you were really out here trying to do it, trying to help out our community. Um, but for the ones who don't know who you are, I don't know who doesn't, but you know, we have some people who are tuning in for the first time. Can you explain your story a little bit, where you came from and what you're about? And then we'll go into some of the topics we want to talk to about today. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I was born into financial poverty mm. uh north central philadelphia uh same neighborhood that bill cosby hails from um i was born to a young mother young father young parents uh third grade we lived in north carolina by virtue of my father being in the u.s military and it was in north carolina that i decided i wanted to be a psychologist because i didn't have an older brother and so I decided I wanted to be the older brother for any child in the future who needed someone to speak with and didn't have an older sibling. So after my parents divorced, we come back to North Philadelphia and I enroll at the George G. Mead Elementary School, North Philadelphia Public School. For some reason, we had mandatory black history class in that particular school during my fourth and fifth grade year. The school district of Philadelphia did not have mandatory black history but somehow, some way, our school did. Mm -hmm. And so in that fourth and fifth grade black history class, my love for black consciousness, the African liberation struggle, as well as public speaking was born. Mm -hmm. There was a oratorical contest in February of Black History Month during fourth and fifth grade in which I entered and I won first place both times. And so my introduction into consciousness as well as my introduction into public speaking began at the same time in elementary school. And then in the sixth grade, I believe it was, the very next year, my father took me to my first family reunion, Baltimore, Maryland, and we're walking in the back of a church. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of Frederick Douglass memorabilia on display. And I knew who Frederick Douglass was from black history class. And I asked my father, why was all this Frederick Douglass memorabilia here at the family reunion? And he said, because you're related to him. Mm. And so before I left elementary school, I already knew I wanted to be a psychologist. I already felt the honor and obligation of being a distant relative to arguably the greatest black leader in American history. And my inroads into black consciousness and public speaking had began. So by the time I was 12, I kind of knew what I would be doing with the rest of my life. I like to say that I'm a living testament to how important it is for our children mm -hmm. to learn about who they are when they are young. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because Absolutely. we often talk about the importance of black history and whether or not we need it. Dr. Umar's living proof that we need it and of how impactful it can be when you get it young in life. Wow. 
Amazing. Amazing. I didn't even know that about your story. Um, a, a lot of people have questions because, like I said, I've, I've been following you for a long time. Um, and one of the interviews that stuck out with me was the Roland Martin interview because mm-hmm. it seemed like, and I like Roland as a person, like I like his mm-hmm. knowledge and political space and things like that. But it was one of the things he said it during the interview. He kept saying, "Well, you know, you're you're not related to um, um, Doctor Doctor uh, was it Frederick uh, Douglas. Frederick Douglass? You're not mm-hmm. related to him. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on that? Why people yes. keep thinking you're not? Because you yes. know, um, no one ever questioned." my kinship to Frederick Douglass up until around the time of the Roland Martin interview. Mm -hmm. And to put the Roland Martin interview in perspective, I had just come off the Breakfast Club interview a week prior. And as you know, whenever I go on a Breakfast Club, it tends to go viral. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Roland was somewhat jealous of all the attention that my Breakfast Club interview was getting. Mm -hmm. So he decided to invite me on his platform, which I had been on several times before. Okay. That was not my first time having a conversation on News One Now with Roland Martin. It just so happened on this visit, he decided to try to uh, make a fool of me Mm. uh, by bringing up unfactual allegations. And with him being a journalist, he could have fact-checked almost anything he asked me during that conversation. That's his job, yeah. That's your job as a journalist, which led me— to the conclusion that the sole purpose of him inviting me on there was to take the air out of my balloon that had been rising so quickly as a result of the Breakfast Club interview. He wanted to embarrass me. Mm. But getting to your to your question, um, the Bailey family is a very large family. Mm-hmm. There's a family reunion held almost every other year. Okay. I've been to several of them. My name is on the family tree. My brothers and sisters' names is on the family tree. Mm. It's not anything up for debate. But the reason it became an item of debate is there's a member of the family. So you're talking about tens of thousands of people, as exactly. any family Absolutely. is large. Yes. So there's one Negro uh, who is a ex-military uh, serviceman who I never met before. But uh, he has made it his personal business to try to disgrace me. From what I understand, he is a belly. Mm. Uh, but there's tens of thousands of bellies, you understand? So he decided to start putting out the false propaganda that I was telling people I was a descendant of Frederick Douglass. Mm. That was the item of contention. Yes. If you listen to the letter Mm -hmm. that Roland Martin read, they never said I was not related to Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. They said I was not a descendant of Frederick Douglass, Mm -hmm. nor have I ever claimed to be. Mm Mm-hmm. Most people know at the end of my speeches, I often give my genealogy. Mm -hmm. I've never claimed to be a descendant of Frederick Douglass, nor do I have to be. I'm a descendant of Frederick Douglass's first cousin, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Henry Bailey, who he mentions by name in Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, the 1845 autobiography. Mm -hmm. He talks about growing up on Tuckahoe Creek with Cousin Stephen. Mm -hmm. Well, Cousin Stephen is Stephen Henry Bailey, a Civil War veteran and a co-founder of the Bethel AME Church in Denton, Maryland, which still stands today. In fact, he's buried a few blocks away from it. Mm -hmm. And so Cousin Stephen, who's also a Civil War general, if I didn't uh, mention that, he and Frederick, it is believed were fathered by the slave master. Wow. And there is evidence that this was known on the plantation Mm. because when my grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey dies in Denton, the newspaper refers to him as Frederick Douglass's brother. Mm. They don't call him cousin. They call him his brother. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, my grandfather, Stephen's son, my three times great grandfather, George Washington Bailey, who was the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland, who served in the U.S. colored troops. In fact, he was at the Battle of Appomattox when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant. Mm -hmm. He wrote a letter to some of the relatives of Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned our family. Mm -hmm. And he refers to his father, my four times great grandfather, Stephen, as Frederick's brother as well. Okay. So when I called Frederick Douglass a uncle, which I have done several times, I was referencing directly the strong possibility that these two first cousins were also have brothers because the slave master had raped both mothers. Mm. In recent years, I've shied away from the uncle reference okay. because it cannot be 100% verified. Gotcha. I'm 90% sure 
that they're brothers to the slave master. Mm -hmm. But because that cannot be verified, I've decided to just refer to Frederick as my fourth great grand cousin, which he is. But at no time have I ever called Frederick Douglass my grandfather. And if anybody disputes that, I have more lectures on YouTube than any scholar alive. I'm more popular than any black scholar alive. I'm invited to speak around the world more than any black scholar alive. My interviews and my lectures and my podcast conversations have been reposted and retweeted and republished more than any other living black scholar in the world. Mm -hmm. And so all you have to do is bring forth the clip of Dr. Umar saying, I'm a descendant of Frederick Douglass or a grandson of Frederick Douglass. And so things got a little more heated because the same coon who said <laughs> I was going around claiming to be a descendant of Frederick Douglass yeah. actually went to the descendants of Frederick Douglass. Remember, I'm coming from his cousin line. I'm mm -hmm. not of his line. Yes. So this Negro went to the family of Frederick Douglass, the descendants, mm -hmm. and told them that I was going around telling people I was a descendant. So they started a hate campaign. Mm -hmm. So to make a long story short, nobody has ever refuted that I was related to Frederick Douglass. No one has refuted that. Mm -hmm. What they're refuting is a false allegation that has yet to be proven that I somewhere, somehow, at some time, claim to have descended directly from the loin of Frederick Douglass, which is an allegation that's absolutely 100% untrue. And that's why I said that you get so much hate because if you can verify all this, especially in the, the new media that we're in right now where you go on Twitter, you can fact check everything. I mean, with the right fact check. I mean, you know mm -hmm. yourself, do your own research, mm -hmm. not go to fact checker, fact 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 checkers i won't even talk about the the stuff that's behind that but you can do your own research and see that everything that you're saying that you're conveying is 100 percent cor correct so i don't really understand why people even it can even disqualify it at this point it's a lot of jealousy out there it's a lot of envy out there we don't have a lot of self-made black men who are political activists mm -hmm. many of our political activists were groomed by older bourgeoisies, groomed mm -hmm. by the white racist Democratic Republican Party. Uh, they were groomed by Masonic organizations, fraternal organizations, mm -hmm. white philanthropists, black philanthropists. There's no one who can claim to have made Dr. Umar except God and my mother. There you go. So I'm very free in my work. I have a free tongue. And to be honest with you, brother, I think that a lot of my envy comes just from that. I'm not a wealthy brother, so they don't, they're not envying the wealth. Mm -hmm. You understand? I'm not an entertainer, so they're not envying that. Mm -hmm. Most people would never want to walk in my shoes given the type of struggles I have to deal with on a daily basis being Dr. Umar. Mm -hmm. So I think they envy my freedom of speech. Wow. I really think they envy my freedom of speech because I've even been, been around entertainers, plenty of them, mm -hmm. who don't have the freedom to speak truth to power as I do. Now, they're worth millions of dollars. Some of them are worth billions of dollars, but they don't have the freedom of speech. And I think it's my ability to go anywhere and say exactly what I feel and know to be the truth is what gets under other people's skin. And the fact that I'm a very effective public speaker, I think, also adds fuel to the fire. Yeah, because there's few people in the world who could take that microphone from me and do a better job at it. Mm -hmm. And the black community is probably almost nobody on my level, elder or youth when it comes to public speaking, something that obviously runs in the family because Frederick Douglass had the same ability as yes, he did. So, you know, I think the oratory is also a point of envy, the credentials, the education. I think all of it plays a role, mm -hmm. but I think my freedom of speech and my oratorical skill probably leads the list. Well, you're, you're an awesome individual, man. I, I really Appreciate admire you. your... Appreciate your tenacity, um, your philanthropy, and what you're doing, not only for people, but specifically for our people, because we definitely need it. I want to get to a couple questions here mm -hmm. um, that I have from family members and things like that. Sure. Um, the first two questions, uh, first question I'll ask is from my sister, Alicia Hammond. Um, Alicia, how you doing? You know, uh, <laughs> shout out to her. She got my beautiful niece out there in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh. Um, so this is her question. She said, uh, Dr. Umar, so I've been following you for some time now, and I know your journey that has taken you and uh, taken you to achieve the goal that you have recently acquired by opening up the Frederick Douglass School. I was wondering because of a of the long stretch that has taken you to get to where you needed to get to um, with your journey, would you do it all over again um, the same way, knowing that you're being stretched out by acquiring money and all that, or would you take a different route? 
Great question. First, I would say I wasn't stretched out in acquiring money, nor was I stressed out mm -hmm. in acquiring money. The Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy will be the first school in American history mm -hmm. built exclusively by the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. Never before done. So you can't compare it to any other school because no other school has done that. That's true. And what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing it, no other school is doing that. Mm -hmm. So when people offer constructive or unconstructive criticism, I ask them upon what basis are you making your analysis? Because what I'm doing has never been done before. When somebody is the first to do something, how do you appropriately and responsibly critique something that's never been done. You can't. No other school in American history has been built exclusively off of a global African donation. Mm. We're the first. And when people say it's taken a long time, by whose judgment are we determining that it's taken a long time? Mm -hmm. Nine years for an independent institution, in my opinion, is not a long time. No. And coming from a community of American Africans who don't have a history or a love for building our own independent institutions, I would dare ask if individuals are growing discouraged because the amount of time it's taken to bring forth to school, why don't you bring forth a school? Hmm. Let Show me how quickly it should be done. Thank you. But no one is doing that because a lot of our people don't want the responsibility that I have to obtain, to protect, to secure, to build, to renovate, and to operate the school. Institutions take a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And in dealing with the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy campaign, I have saw firsthand how dedicated you have to be to this to see it through. You True. absolutely have to love your people to build an independent institution because my patience and my commitment was tested as far as it possibly could be mm -hmm. from the vandalism to the thieves to the unscrupulous contractors to that. the racism yeah. uh, to the city bureaucracy. I mean, everywhere I turned, brother, I was being hit with opposition. And sometimes I would sit at the school and I would ask God like, um, is this supposed to work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or mm -hmm. am I, did you bring me this far for me to fail? Mm -hmm. You know, and then all of a sudden last year we had our second annual FDMG festival and it was a new moon in Taurus or Libra. I forget. Mm -hmm. And just something in me said everything about the change. And the day before the festival, we finally got both HVAC units that we had already purchased, but we couldn't find nobody to do the work. Mm -hmm. I remember we that. got both of them put on the school. And I said, you know what? I think there's new moon is about to change things over because the school, I, I'm a practitioner of Yoruba uh, spirituality out of Nigeria, mm -hmm. and there's a divinity of Oshun. It's an energy God created to oversee all things related to wealth and abundance, mm -hmm. happiness and love. Mm -hmm. And Oshun is the ruling divinity of that campus. Okay. So when that new moon came in, in an Oshun sign, Libra or Taurus, and I forget which one it was, I said, maybe, maybe the universe is going to smile favorably upon FDMG. Mm -hmm. And it did. Wow. Within three months, the school was renovated. Wow. Within three months. Congratulations. The problem... Yeah. I had to use white contractors to do it. Mm. For three years, we waited on black contractors to do it. Nobody stepped up. They they stepped up oh, okay. and took our money. <laughs> they oh. stepped up and didn't finish <laughs> wow. the work. Wow. They stepped up and didn't do things by the book. You understand me? Yeah. They stepped up and scammed us. And that's not to say all black contractors are scammers because I know some great ones, right? Absolutely. The problem is the ones that are great are not licensed to do the work in Delaware. Mm -hmm. If I was in Philadelphia, I think the school would have been done because Philly is so large. Yeah. You can get black contractors from anywhere. But operating in a small state like Delaware, the second smallest state, and then in the city of Wilmington, the, that requires you to be licensed in the city, mm -hmm. not just in the state. Wow. So even if you're licensed in Delaware, if you're not licensed in the, the state, state of Wilmington, you can't still do can't it. do the work. Yeah. You follow me? So we were triple yeah. handicapped wow. in trying to get effective work. But be that as it may, when I get back to Philadelphia this week, uh, the final touches on the HVAC system should be made. And I'll be contacting the city to see if we can get our certificate of occupancy. We won't be completely done because now we got to beautify the school. So we got the paint, do the floors, mm -hmm. patch up all the holes that the plumbers and the electricians and the HVACers had to make mm -hmm. in order to do their repairs. But we're at the tail end now. Uh, we were looking to do a grand opening uh, sometime this summer, maybe a third annual festival. Okay, But I think I'm going to wait. Stop spending all that money on the festivals because that's a costly penny. Mm -hmm. Get everything done. 
and then have a grand opening quite possibly during Kwanzaa week. Okay. We may do a community grand opening for the seven days of Kwanzaa for all of our donors and supporters to come and see the school and probably have a conference inside. So a whole seven day celebration. And then next year we're looking to start school for second, third and fourth grade black boys. And then we're going to add a grade up and add a grade down every year after that. So if the first year is second through fourth, the second year will be a first through fifth and the third year will be K through six. And then the fourth year will be a pre K through seven, fifth year daycare through eight. And then the high school, cause we have two schools. Okay. And to be honest with you, the great miracle on all of this, even for those who think we took a long time to acquire the school, which we started raising funds in 14, we got the school in 19. I don't think five years is too long, no. especially for the quality of building we got which was built with a $16 million budget mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So the school is only 10 years old. Wow. $16 million budget. And we got two buildings. Wow. And the building we're renovating now, the Marcus Garvey Elementary School, is the smaller of the two. Mm -hmm. Once we renovate the Frederick Douglass High School, we will be large enough to accommodate any conference, any seminar, any workshop, anything we want to do, we can do it once the full campus is renovated, which will make us the largest modern independent black school campus in the country and to my knowledge the only independent black school operating inside of a real school building mm -hmm. not a church not a storefront not somebody's basement or home mm -hmm. but operating inside of a real school building we're probably the only ones in the country who have two legitimate school buildings so to answer the good sister's question would i do it all over again the only thing i would change is i would have started fundraising sooner mm. i always knew i wanted to open a school but I didn't start raising funds until 2014. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, I should have started raising money in 2011 when the black consciousness community first took hold of who I was mm -hmm. and I blew up. That's when I should have started raising the money. Yeah. So we should have started raising the money sooner. I don't regret waiting three years to try to get black people to step up and help me do this yeah. because I think it's very important that we do as much as we can with our own people. True. And so when it's time to go across the street to the high school, once again, I'm going to try to find black people to help me. But at least now I know if black people cannot get the job done, there's a group of white folks who are willing to to earn that money. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Wow. Um, whew, that's a lot to unpack, man. <laughs> um, I have a, a few with a question within those questions. So you said that you had a lot of donations from our people, right? Yes. Did you take any donations from any other race? Not to my knowledge. And okay. what I mean by that, if you send me a cash app of $5, yeah. your cash app name or your cash app profile pic may not obviously show that you're not an African, right? Of course, yeah. If you send a donation to PayPal or even a check, your name may not obviously show that you're not an African. So is it possible there's some donations that may have come from non-African people? It's possible, mm -hmm. you know, but not to my knowledge. I haven't seen anybody who wasn't African make a donation. And for those who are not African who ask, can they? I let them know. I appreciate your support, mm -hmm. but this is something we have to do for ourselves. And the reason for that, as a pan-Africanist, Self-determination is the heart and soul of our movement. Yes. Whatever has to be done for African people must be done by, by African, African, African people. people exclusively with no outside membership, no outside monetary contributions. The reason why that's so important, when FDMG opens, if half of that school was financed by the government, if half of that school was financed by Walmart, mm -hmm. if half of that school was financed by Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. The victory is not really a victory for us mm -hmm. because once again, you have white philanthropists helping black people, quote unquote, solve their problems. Yep. It's not a true victory. Yeah. But when we open up that school and you walk through there, it's not a solution to every problem we have. But the miseducation of our children is one of our most momentous problems. Mm -hmm. You can say we did this. Black people did this, and we did this from all over the world. I got just as many donations from Africa as I get from Europe, just as many donations from Europe as I get from the Caribbean or Canada mm -hmm. or South America. Literally, all black hands were involved in the creation of this school. Wow. And for it to be the first school of its type to do that, I think that's one heck of a contribution and one heck of a achievement in only nine years. Absolutely. Um, w now, when the school opens... Um I'm just asking questions that no people, problem, I'm, no try, I'm trying to remember no every, all the questions that people ask me. So no I'm problem. just kind of throwing in my head right now. Um, when the school opens, are you just taking nothing but black people or is, can other races come to the school if they want to learn as well? In the state of Delaware, okay, the law does not allow you to discriminate Against. based on race gotcha. in education, gotcha. right? So theoretically, if a white parent wanted their white son to come to the school, 
we would have to consider him for admission. Okay. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah. As long as that white parent understands everything in here is African centered. Everything. Mm -hmm. That African spirituality is a bona fide course and your son will have to study it. He doesn't have to practice it. Mm -hmm. No child is forced to participate in African spiritual ceremony, but they must understand what it is. Yes. So if they want that, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. I'm, I'm not a bigot. And I'm not a racist. Mm -hmm. You know, would it be better if the school was exclusively African? Of course. Mm -hmm. Do I think it will be exclusively African? I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. I don't think too many white <laughs> folks are going to be interested in sending their child to FDMG Academy, but we would consider them. Okay. You understand? Yes. Um, and so on that note, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. We have about 5,000 resumes that we have to go through for employees, okay. you know, and uh, staff members. And I just tell everyone who's sending in a resume, please make sure you've donated to the school. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't donated, you will not be considered for employment. How dare you send in a resume? Mm -hmm. How dare you send in a resume? For some money, but you ain't trying to contribute. And you to ain't them. gave Thank one dollar. Exactly. You know, so. I agree 100%. Absolutely. So we're looking at the people who have helped get us to this point. And I'm just excited, man. I can't wait to have a school that we own fully independent. We don't need permission mm -hmm. from the uh, Delaware Department of Education. We don't need permission from the Wilmington superintendent to do what it is we need to do for our children. Yes. If you want to take them camping, we take them camping. We want to take them fishing, we take them fishing. We want to take them to a Sixers game, we take them to a Sixers game. We take them a trip to Africa, we go into Africa. You, go. you know, it's all black everything, and we are completely in control. Absolutely, and I commend you 100 percent on that um question number two from my sister uh what is your complete stance now this is going to real deep right here what is your complete stance on the lg uh, lbgtq plus community with no biases what is your sincere belief when it comes to that community my stance is i became a psychologist to help people yes all people but my priority is is my people. There you go. And LGBTQ Africans are still Africans. That's true. And so I still love them. I still care about them. They're still my brothers and sisters. I just had a public disagreement with the leader of the Black Lives Matter Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania chapter. Mm -hmm. She came to my lecture there about a week or two ago and tried to disrupt the event. I had to have security escort her out. But I told the sister, if you want to have a, a, a respectful sit down, I'll meet you for lunch before I head back to Philadelphia. If you really clear if you really care about honest, straightforward dialogue between the two of us. Mm -hmm. But if your agenda is simply to disrupt for the purpose of disruption, then I guess there's no need for us to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. The event that I was invited to in Pittsburgh was about the state of the black community. It was not about the state of LGBTQs. Exactly. But one of the things that the LGBTQ movement likes to do in order to expand their influence and power is they like to get involved in situations that don't involve them, manipulate the narrative, and make it look like like they're being discriminated against or mistreated where nobody was thinking about you at all. Say that this again. was about Thank the you. black community. Yes. It was not about you guys. So that's my sincere position. Uh, I don't support the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, it does not agree with what I believe. Exactly. And politically, it doesn't agree with what I believe because the United States government has a eugenics agenda to exterminate black people. And one of the reasons the Democratic Party has been so adamant about perpetuating the LGBTQ lifestyle, especially more recently, the childhood transgender movement yep. is to prevent black children when they become adults from reproducing. Mm -hmm. You understand the whole Zy away phenomenon. This is an intentional uh, campaign by the U.S. government to brainwash black children into self-sterilization. That's mm -hmm. all it is. It is self-sterilization. If you go back in America's history, back to the early 1900s, half the states in this country were going around forcibly sterilizing black people, That's not true. allowing us to get pregnant or get married. They said that we were socially undesirable yep. and they would literally take you off the street, take you to the hospital and, and, and sterilize you. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't find out till years later you were sterilized. You your kids. mother didn't yep. know. Your father didn't know. Yep. Fannie Lou Hamer, one of our greatest black activists out of Mississippi. She was sterilized without her knowledge. Wow. 
keeping the population of blacks in America down and ultimately getting rid of it has always been a government mandate since yeah. the end of slavery. Once we were no longer economically useful to America, they automatically came up with schemes and scams and programs to get rid of us. Mm -hmm. So this childhood transgender thing, this whole LGBTQ thing is nothing but eugenics in another face. It is eugenics masquerading as LGBTQ rights. Yeah. When a child takes hormone blockers and hormone replacement surgery, and when a child goes and has their natural God-given genitalia rearranged so they can now live their life as the opposite sex, no longer being able to procreate, you just sterilize to yourself. Mm -hmm. That is eugenics, that is genocide, that is population control. Yes. And I just want the black community and members of the LGBT community to wake up and understand this has nothing to do with family rights. This Thank has you. nothing to do with sexual liberation. This is genocide. And they are brainwashing our children yes. into committing self-sterilization in the name of black population control. Absolutely. Me and my wife talk about stuff like this all the time because like I told you, my wife is Nigerian and we talk about a lot of the stuff with the belief systems and stuff that coming from Africa mm -hmm. to America and all that stuff, right? And one of the things that we've been talking about is the plan, Planned Parenthood and and all the, you know, the jab stuff that mm -hmm. has happened and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is an agenda. You, uh, pe people need to understand that it's not about your your damn stance on it or it's not about uh, you you wanting to live your life in a certain way. Hey, if you want to be, you know, same sex and you, you, like, you love that and all that stuff, more power to you. That's between you and God at the end of the day. But I, I always tell people, just don't bring it my way. Mm -hmm. Live your life and all that, but understand what the bigger picture is and what they're trying to do. What is the bigger picture? They want to, especially in our community, because they, they only see us good for certain things. Like, we're only good maybe for entertainment or if we're not an athlete or if we're not, you know, uh, military. A, a military or something. Something where they can leverage Olympics. and use us. But, if you know, if we try to say, hey, well— I'm a I'm a, a seven figure six figure earner. I'm a businessman. I I'm, I'm good in tech. I'm good in you know in the uh, um, the oil industry. Whatever the case may be, something that mm -hmm. I'm I'm valuable at. They don't want that. They mm -hmm. they want mm -hmm. their people to be up there, but not us. And Absolutely. it's not all of them because I, I I deal with a lot of races and I, I love a lot of a lot of people. I just love mm -hmm. people all the way across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. God said, "Love thy neighbor." I love everybody, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I understand what's going on, mm -hmm. and I'm not. I'm not immune or 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 uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, I, I I I'm knowledgeable on what's going on. I should say, it's and it's just to me, you have to be Stevie Wonder to not see what's going on at this point in time. Absolutely, it, it doesn't matter what you what you what you believe in, mm -hmm. and what and again, it doesn't matter what you believe in or what your um what your you know. Hey, I. I I, I I'm, I'm my sexual desire is for the same sex. Mm -hmm. That's fine, mm -hmm. but understand that they're push, they're leveraging you and using you to push their agenda Absolutely. and narrative because they don't want you to reproduce. Absolutely, you just saw it about a week or two ago when Vice President Kamala Harris went to yep. Ghana. Yep, you know, and from Ghana. Threats were made to the president of Uganda mm -hmm. regarding their new laws outlawing uh, same-sex relationships, and of course she. Uh, put some pressure on the president of Ghana mm -hmm. to modify Ghana's position on homosexuality. Why does the United States government care about how an African country chooses to legislate family? Mm. Why is that any of your business? It shouldn't be. Africans are the oldest civilization in the world. Mm -hmm. We've been operating family in the community before you even existed. Yeah. How dare you come and tell us how to operate family? Why is that such a concern? Mm -hmm. You're not in the Middle East where homosexuality is punishable by death. You're not threatening Saudi Arabia with a recusal of uh, international funds. You're not threatening Qatar. You're not threatening Iran and Iraq. None of the Arab states that America does government with have, are that. being mm -hmm. threatened with the cancellation of foreign aid if they do not change their stance on homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Only African countries are being threatened with the termination of foreign aid if they do not accept same-sex relationships. And why? Because America knows if we can get enough homosexuality in Africa, sooner or later we'll be able to finance a lesbian, homosexual, or transgender candidate. Mm -hmm. Once we get a couple of LGBTQ presidents mm -hmm. of independent African states, we can now go full force with our population and family planning control agenda. The United Nations came out a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. They said 
Most of the world's oldest people in the next 25 to 50 years will be Africans. Mm -hmm. Africa's population is projected to double or triple over the next 50 years. Wow. This is why America is so aggressive with the LGBT agenda in Africa. Mm -hmm. They feel that if we can somehow get to the public school children in Africa, wow. if we can get to the black babies on the continent and inoculate them with this pro-transgender agenda and start paying for their hormone blockers and their sexual reassignment surgery we can start to cut down the numbers of black people in Africa as you said your personal preferences are one thing yeah. we're talking about a government agenda for African racial extermination and why do you why do you think that our just not, just not necessarily just our people but why do you think people they they can see it if you can turn on TV you can research mm -hmm. something you can see it why do you think that they're just not taking heed to it like, what, a couple of things I think white people are aware. Yeah. I think white people are aware. Uh, I think there's three reasons why African people, particularly in America, have a difficult time understanding that this is an agenda. Mm -hmm. Number one, our spiritual and religious background mm -hmm. makes it hard for us to comprehend. Yeah, let's, get the on, let's get into the religion part. Yeah, yeah. The possibility that a people can be so diabolical and so demonic that you would literally plan for the extermination or near extermination of an entire species, even down to their old people and children. Mm. Most black people cannot wrap our minds around the possibility that there exists a secret clique of financiers who are willing to fund the extermination of an entire race. Mm -hmm. Our cultural and spiritual and communal ethos doesn't allow us to even begin to engage in that type of a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's so foreign to who we are as black people that we often come to the conclusion it can't be true. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, we are so disorganized as a race, mm -hmm. not only in America, but globally that we don't even think it's possible for such an agenda to be carried out because it requires so much collaboration. Mm -hmm. It requires so much cooperation. It requires so much ingenuity for you to carry out a plan like this. You're basically taking what Adolf Hitler did to 6 million European Jews, mm -hmm. and you're going to generalize that to 2 billion global Africans. Mm -hmm. If he could do it there, and by the way, he was funded from America. Mm -hmm. He got his ideas from America. And most of his corporate support was from America. Okay? If he could do it on a small scale 60, 70 years ago, mm -hmm. why can't America do it now on a big scale with the type of technology that she has? The mm -hmm. COVID, the pandemic, was simply a quick test run on how quickly and effectively can we get rid of black elders. Hmm. The, the pandemic was about killing the elders and killing off black people who had weak immune systems. That's all that was about. And why did they want to kill off so many black elders? Because the social security system of America is so stressed right now because they don't make America's corporate giants pay enough taxes yeah. to support the social security system that is being overtaxed. Mm -hmm. So they say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to wipe out as many black elderly as we can. So many of them are unhealthy. So many of them are disabled. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of them are, are dependent on white man pharmaceuticals, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just wipe them on out. And another reason they had to wipe out the, the elders in the black community is they needed to redirect their Social Security money to the Ukrainian immigrants. Mm -hmm. See, the Ukrainians that were brought over here, they're now allowed to qualify for Social Security payment. Wow. How are they getting Social Security payments? Because we killed off so many thousands of black elders who no longer need the Social Security payment because they're under the ground. We can now redirect the Social Security payments to the Ukrainians. Wow. All of this is an agenda. Wow. And it was some kind of partnership with the Ukraine to be able to do that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They're giving Ukrainians housing, mm. education, medical, jobs, Social Security checks. How you got time? How did you find money? <laughs> To wow. give Ukrainians SSI checks when you got homeless black people. Thank you. You got people on the street that if they had an SSI check, they wouldn't be on the street. Thank so you. you could say on the street, but we're going to take these non-Americans, never paid taxes, never worked, never contributed, didn't build the country, as in the case of our ancestors. And we're, we're going to give them the resources that black people are entitled to. And this is why I'm telling African people, as I did on my live this morning, mm -hmm. we have to stop being multicultural. Mm -hmm. We have to stop pushing this people of color agenda. We have to stop pushing this racial diversity agenda. All that is a distraction that 
helps the U.S. government ignore you and give your race, give your resources to, to all the else. other non-white yeah. groups in America. Nobody likes black people. Not brown, not yellow, not red, not white. We can't seem to get that through our thick head. So we have a bad habit of speaking for all the non-white groups as if we are one. Mm -hmm. Since when did we become one? Name me an ethnic group that has ever come to America and has fought and struggled for black liberation. You can't name me one. There may have been individuals, yeah. but systemically, no race, no ethnic group, no nationality has ever come here and helped black people. They don't come to help you. They come to replace you and i'm not saying hate i'm not saying dislike emotion is irrelevant mm -hmm. we have to be political thinkers we have mm -hmm. to be chess players there's no room for emotion and hate i'm asking you to understand the world and the reality in which we live because if we do not master the mentality of the slave master we'll never overcome the slavery mm. wow powerful powerful um that that I'll, I'll piggyback off what you just said by saying this. Um, one of the videos I actually did a remix to your video too. Um, I was in front of my office here and I did a remix. Um, I want you to kind of elaborate and go a little bit deeper when when it comes to this subject. Um, the four, I think it's either four or five essential um, um, needs that a community needs. So, so you're talking about banks, you're talking about supermarkets, hospital, hospital things the like supermarket, that. Supermarket. So everything you just said school. in regards to why uh, uh, Africans and blacks need to really understand, we need to come together as a community. Because me, me personally, I'm, th I'm just telling you how I feel. I don't think we have a community. We're so divided. We, we, our, our, our minds is all over the place. We don't really come together. Like I, I like I said, I network and I, I mm -hmm. have business with a lot of different uh, uh, multicultural races, right? And I see how they are about their their mm -hmm. their race and their mm -hmm. community, and then they're they're supposed to be. You know what I mean? In the Jewish community, their dollars is circling within mm -hmm. like what was it like what twenty one days yes, or some some some, yes, some number? Ours is like what two hours, an yep. hour, if that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can you kind of go in a little bit about the the banks and the supermarkets and the hospitals and and all that? Yes, why indeed. we that, why those are essential needs for our community? And along with that question as well. You have to ask the question, why do we no longer have them? Because we once did. Yeah. We had our black Wall Streets. We had our self-sustaining communities. And although the black Wall Streets were probably the greatest examples of black independence, we still had plenty more examples than those. Mm -hmm. Okay. The bank is there to invest in the people. Mm -hmm. The school is there to educate them. The supermarket is there to feed them. The hospital is there to save them. Mm -hmm. And the fifth institution would be a manufacturing and distribution mm -hmm. to employ the people and provide them with their basic needs, mm -hmm. right? So those are your five essentials. Nowhere in America do you have that. 50 million Africans spread across 50 states and not a single black Wall Street still in existence. We had them before. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in American history, black people once owned and operated five hundred hospitals wow we've only been under british north american rule for 400 years so if you owned and operated 500 hospitals that means we were building and opening more than one a year mm -hmm. for 400 years mm -hmm. think about that for 400 years on average black people owned and operated a new hospital more than once a year. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? Integration happened to it. Mm -hmm. And when I say integration happened to it, I'm not talking about the government policy because the government never forcibly integrated black people. Mm -hmm. They only desegregated. Mm -hmm. Desegregation is the removal of the legal barrier to access. Yep. Remover of the legal barrier. Let's go to the Little Rock Nine, 1850, 1957. Mm -hmm. Did the government forcibly integrate? Well, they finally did in the end, but all they did was legally say, you can't keep the black kids out. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do anything to guarantee them access. Mm -hmm. So when you look at black people who say, well, integration destroyed us, I agree with you. Yeah, to a degree. But it wasn't imposed by the government. Yes. You we chose. Did that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who forced us to close down our independent black schools? We did that. Who yep. forced us to close down our independent black hospitals? Yep. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, the black Wall Streets were burned out, but guess what? We still owned, owned the land. Mm -hmm. And after many of those massacres, those brothers and sisters came back to build. Do you know what happened? The second and third generation of those black Wall Streets, not all but several, mm -hmm. they didn't believe in an independent black community. Wow. By then, integration had come. Mm -hmm. They said, well, why do I want to keep an independent black community? I could go live with the white folks. Look at our HBCUs now. 
for people who talk about integration killed us, look at the state of the HBCU right now. Mm -hmm. They are closing down, threatened with financial sabotage. Why? Because the predominantly white institutions are stealing all our top athletes. You follow me? They're offering more scholarship money, and they're stealing the black child away from the HBCU campus. Is the government making us send our kids to the PWIs? No, we're sending our children to the PWIs. Let's take black people who move into white suburbs. Did the government make you move into a white suburb or did you voluntarily take your black ass to a neighborhood where you're not wanted? Mm -hmm. You understand? So we will look at the government and say integration destroyed us or we'll try to blame Dr. King by saying integration destroyed us. Dr. King was assassinated in 68. Mm -hmm. Integration had not even come yet. Yeah. The bills had just went through Congress. Not only that, the only integration Dr. King brought you was social integration. Dr. King desegregated public accommodations. Mm -hmm. That's it. Nothing but restaurants, hotels, trailways, Greyhound, Amtrak. That's it. Mm -hmm. All other integration came after Dr. King, and it came because black people desire proximity to white people. Mm, okay. So Our psychological self hatred and low racial self esteem is why we don't have anything to call our own. And the sad thing is, we don't even want anything to call our own. Most black people are so hypnotized by white supremacy that we don't believe we can call ourselves a success unless we're working with, sleeping with, or living next to white people. Mm. Well, okay, so let me push back a little bit um, because I'm a I'm a fairly successful uh, um, you know black man or whatever came from and, 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 and you know it's in my books. So and when you get a chance, read it. Um, Definitely. Just kind of came from L.A. Grew up, you know round hoods and things like that with my mother and all that. And I also had some, some good things in there growing up as well, but then, you know, became a successful individual in all the business endeavors I got. Right. Um, I'm gonna keep it 100 with you. I didn't get there with, with my people. Mm -hmm. I, I got there by leveraging other people and mm -hmm. helping because my a mentor told me one time, he said, Julius, if you are, if you and another person are on a boat in in the sea, right. And the boat tips over, he said, both of you guys are uh, are now, you know, drowning or whatever. One of you guys got to get your ass up on shore to pull somebody up. Because one thing in our community that I, I hate that we're like this, but we have such a crap in a barrel mentality. It's like, well, once we get up there, you know, forget the rest of y'all Negroes. You know, now I'm up here and I'm 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 with the bourgeoisie. Like you said, I'm with the with the with the powers that be now, right? But um, okay, so the whole <clears throat> moving out to the white, white, you know, white neighborhoods or whatever the case may be. The only reason why I will push it back a little bit is because now what if you're a success and, you know, you necessarily don't have to be driving nice cars and all that stuff, but you just, you know, successful, you're better than where you were. Right. But then you stay where you are and then you end up staying where you are. But look what happens to the Nipsey hustles of the world. Look what happens to the young Dolphs of the world. Look mm -hmm. what happened to we could try, trying to stay where you are, but our people are so jealous and that's not just our people, but a lot of people are jealous, but our people are really jealous. Why would I stay here and risk? And I have a family risk this, you know, my, my, my daughter and my son, not having a father, my wife, my wife, not having a husband no more trying to stay with them instead of not necessarily moving to the white neighborhoods, but moving out to get, to have a better life. Great question. Couple components to that. Um, number one, and one's individual path to success may be commendable and respectable. Mm -hmm. But what are we doing as black men systemically I got you. to lift the quality of life for black men? Mm -hmm. So they are never in a situation to become jealous of a young Dolph mm -hmm. or to become envious of a Nipsey hustle. Mm -hmm. So we're still responsible because although we may escape it, a lot of us do nothing to help others do the same. Mm -hmm. I am because we are. We are because I am. The principle and spirit of Ubuntu is something that black people need to practice. What happened to Nipsey is wrong, and I believe he was trying. Young Dolph, it was wrong, and I believe he, he was, was trying. trying. Yeah. But again, they're individuals. Mm -hmm. We as a community of black men, successful black men, working class black men, black men, period, mm -hmm. need to come together and say, how do we lift the rising tide so it benefits all of us? Us. Yeah. 
though. A yes, you're going to be victimized if you come back wealthy in a community for, full of poor people. Mm-hmm. That's true whether you're Chinese, white, <laughs> yeah. Native American, or Arab. You that's see, true, yeah. that's going to happen. The question becomes, what are we doing to lift the quality of life for other black men so we don't become such a threat? Because when I look at the gangster rap community in particular, yeah. they are literally, literally bragging to poor black people about what they have and what you don't. Mm-hmm. That's the entire narrative of gangster rap. I am rich. I am wealthy. I got cars. I got clothes. I got, got jewelry. Chains, yep. And you have nothing at all. Mm-hmm. And so then when you go trying to have a meal with your family, P&B Rock there you at go. Roscoe's right here in L.A., yep. right? And he gets murdered. The brother didn't do nothing wrong. But what happens is poor people are so tired of black celebrities bragging about what you have mm. and not coming back to help anybody else that somebody who doesn't brag about what they have, P&B Rock, he wasn't one of those braggadocious type brothers. He was a low-key king. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to take it out on him. Yeah. Since y'all want to keep on flaunting what y'all got, I'm going to take it out on him. And to that point, I'm going to say this. The black community is as guilty of creating mass murderers as is the white power structure. Yes. And the reason I say that is this. We raise our children on an appetite of conspicuous consumption. We teach black children that to be somebody in this world, you got to have Balenciaga, Gucci, mm-hmm. Louis Vuitton, Nike, Mercedes, BMW. This is what we teach them. The black community is the most materialistic community in America, mm-hmm. which is a total contradiction of our alleged religious and spiritual claims. Because yep. you can't be Christian and be that in love with materialism. It's impossible. No spiritual adept is addicted to material conspicuous consumption. But getting back to my point, if we're not valuing education, if we're not building our own schools, if we're not training our own children, if we're not giving them no economic or entrepreneur activity, Mm -hmm. but you tell them you got to have this to be somebody, but I'm not going to put you in a position to earn it legally. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you're doing? Yep. You're breeding an entire generation of criminals yep. because you're telling me I got to have this to be somebody, but you're not doing nothing to put me in a legal position to acquire it, which means the only way I get this when I don't have this is to kill and steal by for doing it. something illegal. Yep. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. we are literally through gangster rap, but not just the gangster rappers. Look at our black professionals and the way they flaunt what they own. Mm-hmm. You understand me? Yep. Our entrepreneurs and the way that they flaunt what they own. If I'm a poor black kid, whether I look at the rappers, I could look at the church pastor, mm-hmm. I could look at the business owner. Everybody's telling me you got to be materialistic to be successful. Mm-hmm. But nobody's showing me how to do any of this legally. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to rob, kill, and steal. We are literally breeding killers by the way we promote materialism, but at the same time, we reject academic excellence. Wow. Wow. Excellent, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, whew, that's a lot. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I originally, my brother, wanted the FDMG Academy yeah. to be a residential school. I didn't want them to go home, brother. And yeah. then a lot of parents came. They said, why you want our kids to stay overnight? You some type of freak or something? What's going on? See, they already automatically yeah. go there. But yeah. see, I went to a residential high school, Scotland School for Veterans Children, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. This is the city that was burned by the Confederacy during the Civil War. Okay. It's also where Frederick Douglass met. John Brown before his 1859 Harper's Ferry Arsenal raid. And it's also the teenage home of Martin Delaney, grandfather Mm -hmm. of Pan-Africanism. And so that's why I went to school. So I saw firsthand how the captive environment of a residential school can really help you train, educate, and socialize children the way they need to be. Because I understand many black homes are bastions of toxicity. Mm -hmm. Many of our homes are some of the most unhealthy places for children. Public school is unhealthy. But the black home can also be quite unhealthy. Extremely unhealthy. One of the reasons teenage girls right now lead the country in suicide because of COVID, the quarantine. Mm -hmm. When when our daughters didn't go to school for a year to a year and a half, they didn't get a break from the incest. They didn't get a break from the molestation. Mm -hmm. They didn't get a break from the sibling rivalry. They didn't get a break from the emotional abuse from their mother. They didn't get a break from the physical abuse from their father. Mm -hmm. Not to say every black household has this because we have millions of healthy homes, but we also have millions of unhealthy Unhealthy homes. homes. So now you have a black girl struggling. Her only time out from the dysfunction of the home was school. School was the only place, as bad as school was, 
it was my break. Mm -hmm. For 12 months, I got no break. Now, black girls are killing themselves, taking their life at rates we've never seen. Mm -hmm. At rates, fastest growing suicide group, black girls, as a result of the COVID situation. So I know how important and how healthy a residential school can be. And even though FDMG is not residential right now, that is still my long-term goal to ultimately have a residential campus as well because our homes are too toxic to send children back to them. When you're trying to re-Africanize, mm -hmm. you send them back home, they're going to re-Europeanize. Mm -hmm. you, you see that? Mm -hmm. So how do you get a leg up if every time you bring the child out of the psychological filth, they go back home and get rebaptized into white Jesus, rebaptized into materialism, rebaptized into basketball wives, rebaptized hmm. into uh, light Loving skin, dark skin. Stuff, yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Our homes are not what they need to be, brother. And that's why I'm a big supporter of residential schooling. Okay, so who who, who would you blame in order to, uh, obviously, I believe you blame the parents, but uh, the community what, uh, more okay. than the parents, because. As the African proverb says, it takes a village to, to raise, raise a child, a child. Mm -hmm. not a single mother. Two thirds of our children are being raised by single mothers, many of whom work in two to three jobs, raising multiple children alone, not to mention their own psychological and medical issues that they're dealing with themselves. Mm -hmm. You understand that? So I think it's very unfair for the black community and the white power structure to make the single black mother the scapegoat for all that is wrong in black America. It is the community. Mm -hmm. What role does the church play? Why aren't they doing anything? They have money. They have resources. Mm -hmm. What role are the black does the black politician play they have money they have resources what role does the black entrepreneur play they have money they have resources what role does the black community-based organizations play they have money they have resources the masons the greek fraternities mm -hmm. of the elk lodges they have resources they have money there's too many people who should be making a difference too many people mm -hmm. who should be supporting our mothers supporting our single family homes who are getting a pass yeah. to not do so we have to stop a community that's serious about saving itself would never blame its most overworked and exhausted member for everything that's wrong the black woman cannot be made the scapegoat for everything wrong in the black community. It is mm -hmm. the black institution and the community itself that must be held to blame. Whenever a black boy kills another black boy, we all at fault. Mm -hmm. When another girl gets pregnant as a teenager, we all at fault. It ain't just about the mother. It's about all of us. Mm -hmm. That's why in African culture, right, every man is your uncle, even if he's not a blood uncle. Mm -hmm. Every woman is your auntie, even if she's not a blood auntie. Yep. Every elder is your grandmom, even if she's not your blood grandma. Yep. There's no such thing as my children and your children. Mm -hmm. In African culture, it's only our children. Mm -hmm. And so the solution to how we fix the black home, the black community, is we have to get back to the village. Mm -hmm. The village is our solution. But the village requires collaboration and cooperation. The village requires that you put the we over the me. Mm -hmm. And black people have been so Europeanized, which is why I refer to us as Negropeans more mm -hmm. than Africans, we've been so European. Europeanized that our ego, I think, is even larger than the Europeans' ego. The black person is the least likely in this country to subvert his personal selfish agenda mm -hmm. for the best interests of his race. And that's why we did last. We don't get out of this until we come together, which is why I always say until black people hate racism more than they hate each other, nothing changes. You're absolutely correct. Um, and I will say, I will even further elaborate by saying this. Um, we also, uh, you know, we accept a lot of stuff from the government. Rather, it's, um, you know, uh, not not just child care. Obviously, if, if a, a single mother needs that, she needs that. But um, we're talking about being on uh, government assistance. Um, you know, we can go back to the crack ep epidemic mm -hmm. when that was brought in way back in the 80s and things like that. I mean, when, when we when, when we're accepting these government uh, per, per, I, I'll call them permission slips. We're accepting all these permission things to be able to do from them. And we're not really helping ourselves. Now we now you get a community, our community that is getting all this stuff that's flooding into our communities. Now we're like, okay, well, it's almost like we're addicted now. We need this. So if I want to get help, I can't because I'm if I go and do that, then I get off of this government assistance or whatever the case may be. So how do I you would how even do look we, at it a little bit differently? Sure. And I see where you're coming from. Yeah. But I also think we have to keep in mind that when you accept those government subsidies. Yeah. 
they come with so many stipulations. They do. That they handicap your ability to get off of it. Okay. For example, there was a case, a couple of cases, where there was a mother on public assistance, right? Mm -hmm. She had like three children. And so she uh, was forced to get a job through the Bill Clinton uh, welfare to work program where he mm -hmm. cut all the single black mothers off of welfare to get those conservative white votes. And so she took a little bit of her paycheck and put it to the side, right? Mm -hmm. Because she wanted to get out of public housing and buy her own. She was saving to start her own business. So I'm going to use what the government give me. But my goal is to get free. Don't you know they discovered her bank account and wiped it out? Wow. You see that? Wow. So even when you try, I give you the case of a black family. Let's say you have a father who's incarcerated. Okay. Nonviolent drug related offenses because he was trying to feed his family. Yeah. Or he grand theft auto, whatever he had to do to feed his family. Because one thing we got to understand, a lot of crime in the black community is uh, underscored by economic Desperation. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is economic desperation. So the father goes to jail. The mother's forced to use public housing, right? Sure. She got his children there. But guess what? In public housing today, no ex felon can occupy federal funded housing. Wow. So guess what? When daddy comes home, hmm. daddy can't live can't in the there. house with his children. Yep. But guess what the mama going to do? Because that's her husband. She's going to sneak him. Mm hmm. Guess what's going to happen? Government find out that it's gone. Homeless. Yep. You, you see what I'm saying? Yep. So agenda. the government yep. give you a home, but if you try to keep your family together in that home, you could end up homeless. The government give you some financial subsidy, but if you try to budget that subsidy to get off of government aid, and they, find they will out. snatch it all yep. from you. Wow. You see, so we have to, first of all, let us be real honest about something. America has no problem with black people being on welfare, getting food stamps. Oh, of course not. It's helping them. It's helping them. Of course. Because it eliminates competition. Yeah. Let us be clear. They understand how intelligent we are. Mm -hmm. You understand me? As long as I know you comfortable with subsisting on these crumbs that I'm giving you, because nobody on public housing or welfare is living comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest myths. George W. Bush said the welfare queen, Daddy Bush welfare queen, and he used that image of the black woman exploiting federally funded welfare benefits to get elected as president of the United States. Only mm -hmm. one term. You understand? So he came up with the welfare queen. Nobody has ever lived comfortably on welfare. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Especially not a single mother with multiple children. So the thing about it is, is the black community has to create the structures and systems and programs that aid our people to get off of government funding so they can live a life of freedom. Because as long as you're on that, you're not free. No. You understand? You're not free at all. No, you're, but a, the thing you're, is, you're a slave. Still. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They don't want the competition. They don't, first of all, look at how much money America gave Ukraine. You think they care about food stamps? No. <laughs> look, look at the aid to Israel. Look at the aid uh, to Saudi Arabia. Look at the aid um, to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Do you really think they care about welfare? They got missiles that cost a million dollars a piece. <laughs> Thank you. A <laughs> missile. And you think they weren't about some free cheese, <laughs> eggs, exactly. dry milk and butter. No. That's the joke. America. Thank now, you. But they use that to keep poor white people distracted from the power structures agenda, even against them mm -hmm. and keep them barking at us. Mm -hmm. So the government has to keep that racial divide there. It's going to be there anyway, mm -hmm. because the number one purpose of racism is to prevent white genetic annihilation. White people freely mixing with black people sooner or later, they're going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons black people are catching so much backlash right now is because 25 of America's 50 states have a zero population growth for Europeans. Mm -hmm. There are 25 states in the union right now where white people are dying more than they're reproducing. Mm -hmm. And I think this helps to explain a lot of the police violence, the police murder. I think it explains a lot of the microaggressions you get from white people now. Because if you notice, the climate of hate towards black people is higher than it's ever been in a long time. Yeah. And I think some of this is the stress of white supremacy and white America who's been trying to get rid of black people for the past 150 years. But Mother Nature is slowly reducing your numbers. Mm -hmm. And even when you look at interracial relationships, I think part of the reason white women are so attracted to black men, even though they're racist, right? I think because at a subconscious level, we are all motivated to survive. The number one law of existence is self-preservation. And so for the white woman subconsciously, and she might don't even understand it herself, why am I attracted to this black man? I don't even like black people. Because on a cellular level, on a neurological level, on a psychobiological level, your white ancestors 
in your blood want to survive and perpetuate. Mm -hmm. And they identify that black man as the best hope you have of surviving by being injected with his melanin. So we have to recognize that when we do an assessment on white supremacy, look at the political, look at the economic, look at the cultural, look at the social, look at the uh, academic. But you also got to look at the genetic, the anthropological Mm. and the biological. Racism is about the biological survival of white people. It's not about ignorance. It's not about bigotry. It's not about uh, necessarily hatred. It's about making sure I survive. I am the genetically weakest family of all the human groups. The European family is the genetically weakest one. The African family is the strongest one. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get so much of the backlash from all the other groups, because we are the only group that can reproduce without any problem. And we can go so far as. To reproduce with any other group and still make one of our own. Mm -hmm. Think about that now. Mm -hmm. If I lay with the Native American woman, that's a black Black child. child. If I lay with the Latino woman, that's a black child. If I lay with the European Jew, that's a black child. If I lay with the Greek, the Italian, the Irish, the the, the, uh, Teuton, no matter who I lay with, the East Indian, the Arab, that's a black child. Nobody else Mm. has 100% guaranteed Genetic reproduction except African people. Hence why they're trying to get rid of us. We are too damn biologically strong. But now we have to become spiritually and psychologically strong as well. And that's going to be difficult as long as we imitate white people. I think one of the greatest disservices we do to ourselves, our ancestors, and to Almighty God who made us is imitate the people who enslaved us. Mm. How do you imitate the people who enslaved you? Mm-hmm. But every time you see a black woman with that sandy blonde hair, every time you see a black man with a snow bunny, every time you see <laughs> black people defending the racism yeah. that is perpetuated against us, you are shaming your race. And as far as I'm concerned, you're com- committing sin against the most high. Okay, so what, so let's, let's touch on that because um, I know there's going to be some people that will push back a little bit on this, especially the ones that are interracial um, 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 relationships, right? So what if someone, say you have a white woman who's dating a black man and vice versa. What if they're like, I don't see color. I literally just want to date this person because I love them. It's okay. a lie. Everybody see color. Okay. It's a lie. That same woman who tells you she don't see your color. Yeah won't hesitate to call the police hmm. the minute somebody black walks across her lawn. Do, lying, do you understand you're me? You're not lying about that. Do you understand yeah. me? You're not lying about that. Yeah. Okay. Look at the young brother in Kansas City who got shot through the damn door yeah. by the old white man. Yeah. You understand? Shot. He went to the wrong house. He, 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 all, yeah. I, yeah. That's shot the door and then after he shot him through the door, came outside and shot the young boy again. He was the band leader, brother. No trouble, no gangster, none of that. A band leader at the high school, and and, 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 and the devil shot him through the door. Wow. All white people are race conscious. They have to be in order to survive. Any white person who tells you they're not racially conscious is a liar. And this is the gimmick that white liberals run on black people to get our votes and get our money and get our support. I'm not like the other ones. I'm different, really. Mm -hmm. But when you're done doing your ghetto work, when you're done doing your charity service in my neighborhood, you go back to an exclusively white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the white liberal is they like to act like they're struggling with black folks, but they are never, ever interested in giving up their white privilege to be amongst black people full time. Wow. Wow. Dude. And this is why we as a people have to stop letting folks exploit our culture for personal gain because everybody wants to be black when it's time to play basketball. Everybody hmm. wants to be black when it's time for football. Everybody wants to be black when it's time for the BET Awards and the American Music Awards. Everybody wants to be black when the music comes on. Everybody wants to be black at Kwanzaa and Black History Month. All these non all these non Africans want to practice our culture. But the minute the police kill one of us and we got to go to the streets, where they at? Mm. When it's time for us to fight for reparations, where they at? I just read an article the other day that most Americans are opposed to reparations. Mm. But they'll dance to your music. Mm. They'll eat at your Kwanzaa table. They'll celebrate your Juneteenth. You see that? They'll go through all the cultural rituals of a Negro to make you think they like you. But at the end of the day, when it's time to distribute the resources... That's what matters. When it's time to distribute the resources, don't none of them want to see black people get what we are due as a result of the unfair forced labor of our ancestors for two and a half centuries. How dare you say we're not entitled to uh, reparations when we're the reason America is America? You see that? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to stop focusing on the social too much because even with integration, right? Mm -hmm. Black people always talk about the social integration. If America truly believes in integration, prove it. Prove it. 
I'm 17% of the population, 12 to 17%. Mm -hmm. Give me 12 to 17% of your banks. Hmm. Give me 12 to 17% of the homes. Give me 12 to 17% of the land. Give me 12 to 17% of the resources. You follow me? Mm -hmm. If we're really going to be integrationists, don't be a hypocrite. Because all they're giving you is social integration. You can move in my neighborhood. You can come to my college. You can sleep in my restaurant. Excuse me, sleep in my hotel. You can eat in my restaurant. That's social integration. I don't give a damn about that. That's mm -hmm. irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Where's the political and the economic integration? Give me my 12% of everything America owns. Now we can talk about being integrationist. If you notice, they always keep integration to social integration. Hmm. They never deal with the resources. They never deal with the money. Is it is okay? So uh, is, is I, I I hear what your problem is, but now what if, like you know, say in the future or whatever, right? Um, they we have more. They're 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 more. They come together more with us in regards. Okay, well, Doctor Umar, we hear we heard what you said on Wealth Champs and on various other uh, podcasts. It finally, uh, the light bulb finally went off with us. Mm -hmm. Now. What if we just instead of seventeen, we give a little bit more, and we're here with you? Is that's with that still, or you, you're saying, hey, no, that we will wanna... never happen? Okay, okay, I was just speaking hypothetically. Yeah, let's go back to 1968. Okay, President Lyndon Baines Johnson put together the Kerner Commission report. Okay, he put together a team of experts to investigate the causes of the long, hot, bloody summer of 1967. Okay, the 1967 riots were some of the most bloody riots we've had in American history. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. King was assassinated the very next year. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Let's find out what the causes of this riot is." Right? Okay. Kerner Commission. That book is as relevant today as it was 55 years ago, my brother. Mm -hmm. They came to a conclusion and they said racism in America and the ghetto itself was created by white people, maintained by white people and reinforced by white people. Mm -hmm. And they gave two recommendations, many more, but two majors. Guess mm -hmm. what the two recommendations was? What? Education and economics. Economic. Yeah. yeah. Entrepreneurship, job training. So let me ask you a question. If the Kerner Commission coming from the president's own office says you got to give black people jobs to reduce the crime, you got to train them for livable wage skill positions, plumbing, carpentry, welding, roofing, like welding, yep. auto mechanic. Mm -hmm. It's saying this is how you eliminate the crime. Mm -hmm. Fix the schools and give them jobs. Mm -hmm. If the Kerner Commission said that in 67. Why in the hell did the government do the opposite in 1970? Mm -hmm. Why did they come into our community and start taking out all the industrial all building the trade programs yep. out of the high schools, yep. shutting down the fact the very thing that your commission said do? You do the op they did the opposite. They did the opposite. Yeah. I'm saying this to say to you, brother, they know how to fix this. They know how to they know that they're the reason we're in the condition we're in. The problem is we won't use any of our two trillion to change it. Mm -hmm. Here's the, this is the Achilles heel of the whole argument about white supremacy. Mm -hmm. You people are two trillion dollars. Yes, we're doing all this to you. It's on purpose. We created the ghetto. We created poverty. We created miseducation. We created every major problem. We got white folks created. That's undisputable. The problem is if you are two trillion dollar people. With these kind of problems, and you know the white man ain't coming to save you, mm -hmm. how you got time to spend $30 billion on hair, care, and beauty? <laughs> how you got time to spend $4 billion on liquor yeah. and alcohol? Yeah. How you got time for for $800 million on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork? How you got time for, what is it, $22 million on children's cologne? Mm -hmm. Do you realize we could take our Christmas money? You can literally just take one holiday. Christmas, mm -hmm. all the money that you spend at Christmas is going into a black community fund. And from that, we're going to build at least one school. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, uh, open up at least one clinic. We're going to create some sort of manufacturing distribution process and some sort of a credit union mm -hmm. with your Christmas money, brother. My point is you don't even have to sacrifice all your disposable income. Yeah. You don't even have to go Marcus Garvey style. You don't even have to go Booker T. Washington Just put a little style. bit to the side A first. little bit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. A little bit. A percentage, bit. Yeah. yeah. So at some point, as much as we blame racism, and we should, we also got to blame ourselves too. Yeah. We are complicit in our own genocide because our self-hate is so deep mm -hmm. that we would rather sit in it mm -hmm. than try to make a way for ourselves. And to the point you made earlier about the crabs in the burrow, yeah. I made it, I don't care about the rest of you. This comes from slavery. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest psychological techniques that the slave master used to divide us from one another, make us compete with each other versus compete collectively with him, mm -hmm. is they would only emancipate 
one or two Africans at a time. Mm -hmm. The manumission laws, you could only free maybe one, maybe two, maybe five, but never enough for it to really matter to the group. And so what happened was when the slave master said, I'm going to let somebody go free this week mm -hmm. or free this year based on how well you work or how many runaway slaves you're going to snitch on, it could only be one or two. Yeah. So you, ought, you was my brother in the plantation. But the minute the slave master said he only let one of us go, automatically you just became my enemy. Yep. Do you see that? Because I'm trying to be free. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And so what the white man did was he limited opportunity. He bottlenecked opportunity on the plantation, mm. and that automatically made slaves work against each other's best interests mm -hmm. rather than work collectively for the overall best interest. And that mindset is with us today, my brother. Mm -hmm. So you got it going on. I automatically think I can't get it going on because you already got it going on. Mm -hmm. It's more It's more space. There's more room for just one of you. Yeah, of course. There's more room for just one of me. The land is abundant. It's there's a, of more, course. Yes, there's yeah. more room for more than just one Tyler Perry, one Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. But the psychosis, the trauma of the plantation mm -hmm. got us thinking, once you see one black economist make it, Ain't no room for no more. Once you see one black movie producer yep. make it, it ain't no room for no more, which yep. automatically leads us to do what? Start hating on the successful black person because we've been led to believe that once one black person makes it, no other black person can. And then not only that, if you, if you, if you, during the slave owners times, during the slave times, if the slave got out of line, they will discipline them. Uh, and, and more, and sometimes kill them in front of the other slave. Oh, yes. Just let them know, like, hey, if you try us, mm -hmm. this can happen to you. So, Jonathan that, Majors, I think. Th 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 I'm glad I, you just said I, that. I, I Let's see, talk about him. I see. The that was lynching, my next question. The the lynching of Jonathan Majors, the media entertainment public lynching mm -hmm. of Jonathan Majors, to me is an example of what you just said. Yeah, because Jonathan Majors is one of the most alpha black male actors we've had in a long time. Yeah. He's very much like the brother who played Apollo Creed. Mm -hmm. Apollo Creed. You follow me? Yeah. Very alpha. Michael B. Jordan, yeah. Yes. Well, the original Creed from the original Rocky. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the brother's name? Uh, 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 well, I know it's Apollo. You know what I'm uh, talking Apollo, about? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Apollo. Yeah. So, in an, in an era where we're living in, where there's so much effeminacy of the black male being pushed, mm -hmm. you have Jonathan Majors coming out with a very traditional, old-fashioned black masculinity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I believe that they might have set him up to either kill the resurgence of black masculinity. Mm -hmm. I also have my suspicions that they probably wanted to initiate him because, as you know, in Hollywood and in entertainment, most black males, in order to break a certain level of success mm -hmm. and to earn a certain amount of income, not to say that every brother has had to do this, but many of them have to engage in homosexual rights. Mm -hmm. There's homosexual rituals in Hollywood that you must participate in before you can go up. Yep. I believe they came for Jonathan. Okay. And I believe he rejected him. And once he rejected him, they that's said, we're that, destroying you. Because yeah, you can't go that high unless you compromise yourself. Yeah. The white man does not let you get that high through his system without having something he can use on you to humble you if you get out of, you line. out of line. Yep. Absolutely. This is not about that white girl in the cab. Absolutely not. And now you got all these other women coming out who are cooperating with the district attorney's office in New York City now. Yeah. They're going to try to make sure that man never see the screen Again in his life. And I believe is all happening because he is an he is an obviously, at least appears to be, an unapologetic black alpha male. And white society does not like them. The number one enemy of the white man is not terrorism, it's not Al Qaeda, it's not COVID. It is the black man who is not afraid of mm -hmm. white power. When they see a black man who is not afraid of white power, they have to do all they can to try to destroy him. I don't care if it's John Jock Dessalines and Toussaint La Overture. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey. I don't care if it's Marcus Garvey, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Mega Evers, Fred Hampton, Georgia, Jonathan Jackson. Mm -hmm. The one thing America hates more than anything is, the alpha male. is a black, black alpha, alpha male, male. Yep. who is not afraid of white power. Wow. Wow. Deep, deep. And I'm glad that you said that, too, because... I was talking with the I was talking with my wife uh, last week before I had you on. I was like, I'm gonna ask him about uh, Jonathan Majors because I know that's something you've been passionate about. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing about Majors, he's only been on for a second. 
like literally but for a second. Shot. Yeah, he shot him quickly. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I, I you know, I, I watch some movies and stuff like yeah. that, so I kind of know Normally him. Normally, take years to yeah. kind of get the way he got. Yeah, and I went to go. We went to go watch uh, Creed three uh, about a month ago or whatever mm-hmm. in the movies, and mm-hmm. he did an excellent job yes, in that did. movie yes, with did. Michael B. Jordan. Shout out to Michael B. Jordan and uh, yes. and um, uh, Jonathan Majors for that. Um, but for a, for him to like really, it's like whoa. You got you, you got your you got your claim to fame and you're on now, but then you have the mag the the Ebony magazine or I think it's Ebony magazine where mm-hmm. he's in a pink uh, uh, furry coat or something and he, he, he's crossing his legs like yeah you know, with like, Michael B they had him hugging like they was a couple yeah. versus brothers. To me, I believe that the evidence to underscore my point. Yeah, I believe those were early attempts at a feminization. Okay, I believe that was the beginning of the grooming period. Okay. Remember when you groom somebody? Yeah. You don't take the child straight in for the abuse. Yeah. You got to groom them. You That's follow? True. That's true. Uh, if you want somebody to commit a crime with you who ain't never been no criminal, you don't take them straight into the crime. Say, hey, we about to go stick her yeah, up. Because they ain't going to want to do it. Yeah. You got to groom them. Yeah. And I believe that Ebony photo shoot with Michael B. Jordan and Jonathan Majors would look very zesty yeah. and compromising. I believe that was the grooming. That was mm-hmm. the early grooming of Jonathan Majors. And then I think they were coming with more groom Mm -hmm. and he saw it and said, "Uh, -uh. I did that. I held the rose in my hand. You know, I laid on the couch. Mm -hmm. I gave y'all that. Yeah. And he probably thought that's all he had to do. You ain't doing no more, but that's not enough. We need you to bend over and and pay the price of admission. And he said, I'm not doing that. And do you, and do you now? I heard you say it earlier, but do you really think that he's not going to, maybe not the big, big screen, but maybe more indie, indie films or, you know, even some Nollywood stuff or something. Oh, Oh, hands down. He'll be the king of that. Yeah. But that doesn't replace the fact that they took an innocent black man and destroyed him. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. And destroyed him almost overnight. A white actor guilty of what Jonathan Majors did, allegedly slapping his white girlfriend in a cab, this never even sees the light of day. And did she, and did she, didn't, she, didn't she come out and say that it didn't, didn't happen? didn't do it, yes. Oh, my. See, but guess that's what, what? It don't even matter. Yeah. And I believe on her part, Allegedly, because I wasn't there. One thing I know about white women and black males, because I know black men who date white women, snow bunnies, and (laughs) she's still a racist. Mm. And she often parentifies him. Mm. And what happens, especially when they are a black man of substance, the white woman sometimes feels the need to remind him, yeah, you're the celebrity, you're the superstar, you're the millionaire, but I'm still a privileged white woman in America. I could destroy your life overnight. Remember about a year or two ago, Ezekiel Elliott's white girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cowboy spat. fan. I know that? Yeah, I'm a cowboy and she, fan, yeah. And he said he's going to call the police. Yep. And she said, go ahead. They won't believe they you won't anyway. Believe you I'm anyway. white. I remember that. You see what I'm saying? I remember that. The white woman is always in control because she's a representative of the system. Mm-hmm. When you date a white woman, you're not dating an individual. You're dating the entire white power structure. Mm-hmm. And that's what these Negroes don't get. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Majors, why put yourself in that? Ezekiel Elliott, why put yourself in that? Look at Tiger Woods. He already yeah. had a billion dollars taken from him from his first Snow Bunny wife. He goes back with a white girlfriend, puts her out the house. I don't know how long they was living together. Mm-hmm. I prayed that they didn't meet the common law marriage requirement. Because mm-hmm. if that white girl was in that house for two years... Technically, I thought, I thought it was ten. No, no, California is ten years. But what's the? Where were they at though? I can't remember. Florida. I, 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 think, some, he's I think it was Florida. Florida. Yeah, he's more maybe toward that way, East Coast right. or something. Yeah. But I'm hoping wherever he was, that state law doesn't say mm. common law marriage is two years because if it does, he screwed. She got him. Yep. Yep. She said, "I want thirty-two million dollars for you putting me out your house." Wow. Let's go to Robert De Niro. He was married to That's a black woman. That's another one. Did you see the divorce settlement? Mm-hmm. Now, you know, normally when you divorce a celebrity, you're getting half that bag or a big chunk. Guess what they gave Robert De Niro? And then this man is a billionaire. Mm-hmm. Guess what they gave Robert De Niro's black ex-wife? They said, we're going to give you a million dollars a year. Mm. Now, to us, okay, that might be okay. But for a divorce settlement with a multimillionaire Hollywood icon, I get a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. What about my lump sum? And Mm -hmm. check this out. If she ever remarries. The payment stop. The payment stop. I already knew. I ain't never heard of nothing like that. So when we get in these interracial relationships, they don't benefit us. But let me take it to the political Mm -hmm. and and, 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 and the cultural. I'm a pragmatist. So I evaluate everything you bring to me from the lens of how does this benefit African people? Mm -hmm. So when you bring me a black man and a white woman, how does this benefit us? 
You understand me? Homosexuality, mm -hmm. how does this benefit us? Anything you bring me, how does this benefit us? Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the interracial marriage, which is mostly black men and white women, mm -hmm. you're taking resources from our people and giving them to a people who have stolen enough of our resources. Mm. They've stolen our lives. Mm. They've stolen our inventions. They've stolen our land. They've stolen our resources. Mm -hmm. Now they're stealing our children's sexual identity. Mm. You understand me? Yeah. So it's on top of all the theft white people have committed against African people here, there, and everywhere, you love them so much that you want to give the white woman your wealth, your assets. Kobe Bryant. My favorite basketball player. Mine's too. He died, left his estate to a Latino woman. You think she's going to do anything for black people? No. Vanessa Bryant ain't think about helping black people, and she's the custodian of this man's entire estate. Mm. We got to get out of the emotional. If, you, if your self-esteem is that low that you got to sleep with a white woman to get some sort of validation, if your self-esteem is that low that you got to date a white woman in order to feel a little bit more equal to the white man, then date them if you got to do it. I'm against it, but if you got to do it, do it. Don't marry them. Mm -hmm. Don't give them a legal pathway to take possession of your estate and your wealth and your resources and your requirement. Don't give them the legal pathway. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Look at Kanye West child support, and he can afford it. Yeah, but the child I was support about to say was him ridiculous. And Kim, him, him and Kim K. Yep, it was ridiculous. Yep. First of yep. all, if y'all both billionaires, why you got to come off this type of money? Why should? Why does? She, why does she even? even get to receive that type of money if she's already uh she's actually more worth i don't know if well i think she is worth more than him but okay wh why is she even why would they of course we even award her anything knowing that her and her family what they've built over the years why would why, why would the course even award her anything I, I can't even grasp that we have to see it as collateral damage and what i mean by that is this in the eyes of the white power structure yeah we allowed you to access that white vagina for two years, three years, four years, five years. We allowed you to live a false life as an artificial white man by being with that white woman. Mm. We don't even support interracial marriage. This white folks. Mm -hmm. But because we allowed you that, there's a price you have to pay. Wow. And this divorce settlement is the price you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And we hope you learn your lesson. Because if you end up with another one of our women and she divorce you, we're going to do the same thing to you again. Wow. I'm going to tell you the one divorce I hope never happens, although I don't want to see any of our women with a, with a white man, Serena Williams and that white man she went. Yeah, yeah. I got a funny feeling he's going to end up leaving her for a white woman and he's going to take half her shit too. Mm. And I'm a little bit more compassionate with Serena because I understood the psychological terrorism she experienced at those Tennis matches. Yeah. I read it. When she was in Compton, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, re even as a pro. Oh, yeah, yeah. How white people at Wilmington was calling her the N-word, baboon, monkey, gorilla, chimpanzee. Yep. Do you know that there was white people demanding that the U.S. Open give her genetic testing to make sure she was not a man? Mm -hmm. They disrespected Serena Williams any way, every which way a black woman can be disrespected. Mm -hmm. And Serena Williams can never tell me because I know better. I study psychology. Mm -hmm. She could never tell me that she did not have that mixed race African baby, her beautiful daughter. She could never tell me she didn't have that baby because she didn't want that baby with the white man mm -hmm. because she didn't want the baby to have to live a hard life like she did as a dark skin, um, physically strong African woman. You feel me? Do you think, do you think that was her main reason or probably a component, but do you reason. think it was the main reason? It was the main reason. Okay. It was the main reason. And I can say that because I've actually had African people who are not even in Serena Williams level mm -hmm. who told me, yes, I married a lighter woman because I did not want my child to go through the name calling and the African booty scratcher jokes and the nappy head jokes that I had to go through. Yes, I've had men tell me and women, yes, doc. I married somebody lighter because I didn't want my child to suffer like I, like I did. And that's why Serena had a baby with a white man. I well, have no, she may never admit it, but I know that's the reason. Well, let me ask you this, because um, let, let's flip it. Mm -hmm. what, if a, what if a black man who married a white woman and had a baby by her saying, hey, I went through the same things, you know, as far as athlete or not. It don't have to be athlete, but I went through the same things. and I don't want my child to go through that. And I know about my child being half white mm -hmm. that it won't be, even though black would be the, the, the mm -hmm. you know, the, the primary color. I, because I had to have white baby, 
then my my child won't go through as much scrutiny as I did. What if someone says, Dr. Umar, I did the same thing? It's still it should, inexcusable. Okay. Just like it's inexcusable for Serena or Tiger. It's still inexcusable. Gotcha. You follow me? Gotcha. It's inexcusable. If I mean, if you're that hung up on color, go get you a mixed race sister. Hmm. Go get you one of the light skin sisters. Go get you an albino sister. If you're that caught up on the color, you can still get that color inside the race. You go to the Caribbean, you see that all the time. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. So yeah. at the end of the day, it's not about having a light child. It's about having that white woman. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last uh, subject let's talk about uh, we, I want to hit on right here because this one is my, me personally, and this is my question right here. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your take on FBI, the faith-based initiative program that President Bush started to help churches back then and didn't have funding or better yet needed funding? Why do you think that program came into existence? Now, I have my thoughts on mm-hmm. it, but mm-hmm. what, what, is, what do you think? I believe, because you got to remember, the white power structure, they have think tanks. Yes, they're thinking on right now how to get rid of the rest of black people in America. Mm. They think on everything. Mm-hmm. Very strategic, very uh, methodical. We need to become the same. Mm-hmm. We're too emotional and religious based. That's true. You see? That's true. They're methodical and scientific with their plans. They're cerebral with their stuff. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. They knew that gentrification was coming when George W. Bush got elected. Mm hmm. They knew that the LGBT agenda was coming when Obama got elected. They knew that the multiculturalism of America through immigration was going to come under Joe Biden. They knew. Mm. Before we do this, we have to make sure black America's leading fighter for justice Mm -hmm. would be totally impotent to get involved. Mm. And that's the black church. The black church has been the vanguard for the black struggle since slavery. Mm -hmm. We got to get them out of it. All they got left is the church. It's the only institution. It's the only place that still get their money. It's the only place that still get their mind, their time, get the black church. So Mm -hmm. when George W. Bush came up with FBI, and this is amazing FBI. I know. Because they basically turned the pastor into the new coon and the new agent. Mm. They destroyed the integrity of and the masculinity of the black church. Mm. You can't name me a black church in any state, 50 states. Okay. You can't name me a black church that's at the forefront, not showing up to the meetings, not walking at the back of the protest. I mean at the forefront. I'm leading this. Okay. Fight against gentrification. Fight against miseducation. Mm. Fight against mass incarceration. Fight against police genocide. Fight against economic castration. Those are our five biggest problems as yeah. American Africans. You can't name a church in the country, not one, that's at the front of the fight for any of those main problems. I'm thinking hard. Once I can't, the black I'm, church I'm qualified for federal funding, yeah. they were done. Because now they're in bed with the state. They in bed with the state. Yeah. And then they got a nerve to turn around and claim to you that I'm not political. If the black church is not political, why is your church the first stop every politician makes on their road to getting elected? Because they need that vote. They right. need those votes. But if you're not political, don't let nobody use your pulpit, mm-hmm. you understand, yeah. as a sounding board for their election. If you're not political, mean it and be it. But for you to let politicians come and manipulate your constituency into voting for them, then you ain't nothing but a political puppet in the pawn. Hmm. They're useless, brother. We ain't got the old-fashioned black churches we used to have that stood up to the Klan and stood up to the government. They're gone, brother. These brothers are businessmen, and they are in the business of exploiting Jesus for personal profit. And 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 it's funny that you say that because, um, you know, I've, I, I've known some churches that will have the, you know, uh, mayors and other people who will come and try to, 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 to talk to the congregation to try to get extra votes and all that. And I remember, like you said, back then— you couldn't. That wasn't, that wasn't allowed. Nah. No, you couldn't step on my pulpit nah. and talk about Mm-mm. that stuff. Mm-mm. So now they understand that uh, the, the political aspect of it. They understand that, hey, let me get these votes. Let's, you know, uh, cater to whatever they need to cater to as much as our resources can 
to be able to get these votes so that way once I get in office, I can be able to do the things I need to do while I'm in office. Yes, and I blame the black community more than the pastors because we still support the institution of religion. Mm. You you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, We still support the institution of religion. And when I say religion, I'm not just talking about Christians. Yeah. Muslims are just as politically ineffective. Jehovah Witnesses are just as politically ineffective. You, mm-hmm. you understand me? Mm-hmm. So for me, it's across the board. Black religion as an institution, regardless of brand or denomination, has been a great disappointment mm-hmm. in the lives and destiny of black people. Wow. Wow. Well, Dr. Umar, uh, I've had you in the studio for <laughs> almost an hour and a half. Um before you cut, yeah, let sure. me say something about the children. Absolutely. Because the school psychologist and me. Well, first I want to motivate all your listeners to please donate to the yes. FDMG Academy. Yes. And they can do that on your cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. They can do it on their PayPal, paypal.me slash FDMG Academy. Okay. And they can also mail in, check a money order payable to FDMG, 96 third P.O. Box, 9634 Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. All that information is on my website, uh, drumarjohnson.com. I also want them to subscribe to my new video on demand platform where I do a lot of my podcasts because Instagram and Facebook keep on taking them down. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, www.drumar.tv. And if they need to reach me for consultation or life coaching, my cell number 215 989 9858. But I want to say this four quick things for the parents. Sure. Um, number one, Stop putting your children in special education. Mm. Special education is a trap. Special education is an academic prison. Special education is a form of psychological terrorism. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. If the child has autism, a brain injury, if they're deaf or blind, they may need an IEP. Mm -hmm. But the reading disability, you can't even prove that exists. The math disability, you can't even prove that exists. Mm -hmm. Emotional disturbance. You can't even prove that exists. ADHD, you can't even prove that exists. Yep. Most of our kids are in special ed for disabilities that cannot be proven to exist. Mm-hmm. Stop putting your kids in there. They don't need special ed. All they need is tutoring and extra practice in your home. Yeah. I'm saying this because summertime is coming up. Yep. Summertime is coming up. Get them a tutor. Get them to the public library. Take them to the bookstore. Make them practice. Mm-hmm. Most of our children do not have learning disabilities. They have lazy disabilities. Mm. Number two, if your child is in special ed and they need special ed, you better make sure the IEP team is making sure they are achieving their credits towards graduation Mm -hmm. because many special ed children are not on a graduation track, Mm -hmm. but they never tell you this. You, you learn this in 12th grade a month before graduation and you get a letter in the mail saying, we sorry. Your kid's not going to walk the stage. Raheem will not be graduating. And you're like, wait a minute. Why are you telling me this a month before graduation? There's nothing we can do about it now. Mm -hmm. They knew it was nothing you can, they knew when you signed him up, He's not going to get the credits yeah. because he's in special ed. How do you catch up and how do you stay on task if you're going slower than everybody else? Exactly. So please understand, if your child is in special ed, especially a full-time class, mm-hmm. part-time, not so much. Pull out, not so much. Self-contained, he show up at 8 o'clock in a special ed class and he stayed there till school get out, mm-hmm. I can guarantee you he ain't getting no high school diploma. Hmm. Do not let them put your child in a full-time self-contained class. That is automatic dropout, automatic certificate of completion. Number three, don't let the school bully you into putting your children on medication. Oh, please. Yes. Teachers are not doctors. They are not psychiatrists. They cannot tell you your child needs medication to get an education. Stop letting the school bully you into getting your child some drugs. Mm -hmm. The next time they tell you he needs medicine to come to school, Tell them to put that on the letter. Hmm. Can you please give me a letter stating my son cannot come to school unless he is medicated? It's illegal. Mm -hmm. You cannot refuse a child their education because the parent chooses not to medicate. Our parents don't know that. They literally think they got to put them on some Adderall, some conservative. Or they won't be accepted. Exactly. Stop letting them bully you into putting your children on drugs. Number four and my final one. Mm -hmm. Child Protective Services. 
one of the most destructive agencies in the black community. They are taking children away from parents mm-hmm. unnecessarily, unjustifiably. That caseworker who they sent out to your home mm-hmm. is judge, jury, and executioner. That one woman can decide on the spot, this house ain't fit for this child. Yep. Or you ain't fit for the shout and take them. Mm-hmm. So a couple of points. Number one, don't let them in your house. Make them get a warrant from the police. Number two, if you decide to open up the door, get their business card first. Don't you ever let a child service worker come into your house and you don't know who they are. Mm-hmm. Make sure you get their supervisor's phone number and email. Because when they leave your house, they got to prepare a report mm-hmm. that says whether you're guilty or innocent. You have to get to their supervisor before they get to the supervisor. Mm. See that? Mm-hmm. So you didn't already call the supervisor. So so came to my house. She was nasty. She was rude. Mm-hmm. She asked me this. She asked me that. Ain't nothing wrong with my house. Boom, 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 boom. Get to the supervisor before they get to the supervisor. There you go. That is how you win that situation. Number four. Okay. If you have an attorney, have that attorney reach out to the supervisor as soon as possible to nix the situation. But we have to stop telling them everything they ask. We got to stop giving them unbridled access to our home. Mm -hmm. And we got to stop having conversation with them before we even know their name, phone number, email address, or supervisor. We have to be smarter with CPS because there is a deliberate movement in this country, I believe from everything I've seen or read, where they want to turn as many black children away from the home in order to fuel the organ market, Mm -hmm. the illegal organ trafficking market, Mm -hmm. government research, Mm -hmm. and also child sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. In the family court, in the foster homes, in the group homes, they are all involved in the child sex ring. Mm -hmm. The reason they killed, who was the man that they killed who had the island? Uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein. Yeah. Epstein did not commit suicide. Epstein was murdered. Oh, and the reason oh yeah, Epstein of course was he was, murdered yes. Because he said he wasn't going to go down by himself. They had to he was going to name names. He yep. was going to name names. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, if he would have started naming them names, judges would have came up. Certain uh, political uh, po- uh, politics. Yes, government yep. offices would have came yep. up. You yep. understand me? Yep. That child sex trafficking thing, I don't think black people understand. It's a business. It is a business. Yep. And black children are the top commodity. And guess who the number one most in demand child is the black girl, 11 to 17. Mm. So if you have daughters, you got to know where they are. You got to know who they plan with. I'm going to almost say spending the night out is almost a thing in the past. Yeah. You understand? You can't even yeah. risk it anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we got to be a lot more efficient with the way we do things. But in the end, though, brother... My basic message today to our people who are listening to this conversation is if we do not organize, we're going to be exterminated. Mm -hmm. It's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And every group of people in America are ready and willing to help the white power structure of this country destroy black people. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see us survive. Nobody wants to see us thrive. And we have a God-given obligation to put ourselves back where we used to be, and that is on the throne. I absolutely believe that God is disappointed with black people because he gave us the world, gave us the world first. Mm -hmm. Every prophet in our color gave us the richest piece of land on the earth. Mm -hmm. We're the most melanated, the most powerful genetic beings in the world of humanity. I believe God is upset with us because we are still down on one knee when he made the throne for us to sit on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. I no appreciate doubt. everything. No doubt, King. I, I really appreciate it, King. Thank you for coming. Thank yes, you for uh, blessing uh, my platform here. I really appreciate you. Like no I said, problem. I've been following you for years, and you're a wealth of knowledge. Appreciate it. Thank you. you so much, man. Um, welcome to the uh, Wealth Chance family. Um, yes, definitely going to have you on again sure. probably later on this year, no round no two. Problem. Sure. <laughs> we'll see. Sure. We'll see. It'll be some more stuff that'll probably happen in the world Absolutely. that we got more stuff to talk about. But Absolutely. I really appreciate you. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Absolutely. One more thing. Sure. And I don't know why all this is coming no, to No, no, hey, hey, let's go. Jalen Walker. Okay. The brother who was shot 46 times by those eight police in Akron, Ohio. Yeah. June 27, 2022. Okay. None of the police are going to be charged. Wow. The brother got hit with 46 bullets. They shot 94. He got hit with 46 unarmed. None of the police are being held accountable for it. Wow. Then you go to the Shanquella Robinson case, the sister who was murdered in Mexico. Yes. With the friends. Yep. Mm -hmm. No. The FBI said they're not pressing any charges against anybody. Mm. The brother in Atlanta, Laquan Thomas, I believe his name is, who got eaten to death by the bed bugs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Insane, brother. I'm bringing all this up to say that we are at war as a people. Yeah. Black life has no meaning in this country unless we give it meaning.
So whether we like it or not, we are going to have to go on a 20 year sacrificial crusade to reclaim our respect Mm -hmm. and our integrity from this country because they have taken it. And it's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. It's going to get worse. Yeah. Black men better get ready to fight. Black women better get ready to fight. Black youth better get ready to fight because it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we're going to have to pull the chain on these people and let them know we had enough of this Mm -hmm. and we ain't taking it no more. Wow. Well, guys, uh, there you have it, man. You know, there's five components to building wealth. There's spiritual, there's mentalism, which is knowledge, uh, wisdom. There's uh, financial, there's health, and then there's building relationships. Right now, you just had Dr. Umar Johnson who is a wealth of knowledge, as you can understand, as you can understand, he's very passionate. He has the school, um, Frederick Douglas, Mark, uh, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick Douglas, Marcus Garvey Academy. Make sure you guys donate, go to his uh, website, get all his books. He didn't even talk about his books, but go to his website, get his books uh, on Amazon on, in bars and nobles, wherever books are sold on platforms and just donate to his school and make sure we are helping each other. Cause at the end of the day, we're all we got wealth chance family. This is Julius Hammond. Till next time, I'll see you. I love you.